already said, I'm Chirag, so I'm one of the third year residents at, uh, at Ottawa. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to come work with all of you at QCH uh, yet, but hopefully that will change in the future. So this talk was born um, out of a combination of my own experiences and kind of the world events that have happened over the last few years. And it's not an easy topic to talk about, to listen to, or to think about. Um, in fact, it's pretty uncomfortable to talk about these things. And during this talk, there may be moments where you start noticing that you're feeling uncomfortable, uh, moments where you're starting to cringe and you start thinking that, you know, this, this really doesn't feel good. When that happens, I encourage you to reflect on that and think about why you're feeling that way. Reflection is going to be a big theme in this talk. And so it's extremely important for all of us to kind of lean into that discomfort together that we're going to share over the next 45 minutes. Now, as a third year eMERGE resident, I still have a long way to go before I become a staff emergency physician. Um, there are so many things that I still need to learn about. So as I talk about racism in our EDs, uh, I want you to know that just like all of us, I'm still learning and making mistakes. Um, and we have a long way to go together. So in fact, you know, there are scholars that have dedicated their entire lives to racism in healthcare. And while I'm not an expert like any of them, I have spent several months reading their work and trying to relate it to our context as emergency physicians. Now, many of you may have been on, on a similar journey. So um, if you have, I would encourage your thoughts and comments and discussions at the end, uh, because I actually think that's extremely important to make change. Uh, unfortunately, with the software that I'm using, I, I can't actually comment on the chat during the talk. Um, so I'll, I'll address any comments or concerns at the end. Uh, and just as an FYI, if you're using a phone, you may have trouble seeing the slides, which should be here beside me. So you may need to turn to landscape. Um, and as, a, as another note, if everybody could please just turn off their cameras, just so the slides can be viewed uh, properly beside me. Okay, so the goal of this talk is not to single out individual people, but rather just like any other grand rounds, it's to learn and grow as healthcare providers and try to improve our patient care. So today, we're gonna to talk about racism and patients in the ED by discussing bias. And then we'll talk about how Canadian history and systemic racism impacts our patient care with examples fo focused on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, analgesia, and COVID-19. Now, I've, uh, I've been to a fair number of these types of talks on equity, and I often leave feeling this like angst and thinking, okay, well, I feel awful, but what do I actually do about this? And how does this apply to my contacts in the emergency department? So I promise you, this talk is going to relate things to our EDs, and it will have examples of things that you can do from an individual provider perspective, as well as things that you can do from a systemic perspective. So this signpost is going to be your flag that I'm talking about an actionable item. So bias. The story of Joyce Ashokwan, I think, shocked all of us. Uh, she was an Indigenous woman that was 37 years old, and she was a mother of seven ch children. And she was admitted to a hospital for stomach pains. And during her stay, she felt consistently neglected and actually filmed and exposed how healthcare workers treated an indig Indigenous women in hospital. They called her stupid as hell. They said she's good at having sex more than anything else. And they actually asked her who she thought was pay paying for all of this. And she died that night, and we still don't know why. This is explicit bias in action. The healthcare providers actually had an explicit negative view towards Indigenous people, and they voiced that to Joyce. So bias is how you think about, conceptualize, and categorize a group of people in your mind. An explicit bias is when individuals are actually aware of that prejudice towards a group. Overt racism and clearly racist comments are examples of explicit bias. And I think sometimes we feel that explicit bias is something in the past or it's something that, you know, Americans have to deal with. But we in Canada, we're this like completely equitable place. But the racism that Joyce endured actually happened only nine months ago. And it happened in a hospital that is a two hour drive from here. 
I think we can all recognize, though, how awful and wrong it was for this to happen to Joyce Ashokan. But I highlight it to show that it still happens. And we as an emergency community just can't really tolerate this if we see it. I think we have an obligation to our patients and to each other to call it out when we see it. Explicit bias is still a problem. But by and far, the more common type of bias that we display in healthcare is actually implicit bias. So implicit bias is all of the subconscious feelings, the perceptions, attitudes, and stereotypes that we've developed as because of all of our life experiences and social influences. You know, it's this automatic positive or negative preference for a group, and it's based on our subconscious thoughts. With implicit bias, we may actually be unaware that it's biases and not facts that are driving our decision making. So the best example of implicit bias in the emergency department is that of Brian Sinclair. Now, many of you uh, may actually know about his story, but his story is extremely important to discuss because it's, an, it's a glaring example of systemic implicit bias. This could easily have happened at TOH or QCH. So Brian Sinclair was an indigenous man who in 2008 went to his family doctor for a simple blocked Foley and his GP didn't have the resources to fix the issue. So of course, you know, he was sent to the emergency department. So he came to the ED, he registered and for some reason, not yet clear, he was never called to triage. He waited and waited and waited. And video surveillance actually showed multiple concerned patients asking security and nurses to check on him. And everyone was told that the situation would be handled. After 34 hours of waiting, a patient's, another patient's family who returned to the emergency department saw Brian in the same spot. He was slumped over and they decided to alert a security guard. And Brian was already dead from Eurosepsis from that block fully. And on all the subsequent investigations, it really became clear just how dangerous implicit biases are because many of the nurses and hospital staff that were involved ha had a bias that this indigenous man was homeless, intoxicated, and that he was waiting for transport to a shelter and that's why he was in the waiting room. All of the healthcare providers ignored and tried to explain away a disabled, seemingly impoverished person of color without actually in in inquiring into the circumstances of his care. And the fact that somebody like that blends into our landscape to the point that they could literally die just screams implicit bias. All of the research in implicit bias points to one thing. Implicit biases are way more pronounced in situations where people are stressed, fatigued, have competing demands, insufficient resources, insufficient time, and limited information. Well, okay, so that's basically every single eMERGE shift we've ever worked. You know, this would be way easier if we had some super carefree, easygoing workplace. But we don't. Uh, most often than not, we feel stressed. We work in a place that has competing demands. We're busy. We work with limited information. And so it's a perfect storm for our implicit biases. In emergency medicine, we really need to be fast. We need to be efficient. And the only way we can do that is by actually making quick associations based on our patient's characteristics. So if that way of thinking sounds familiar to you, that's probably because you're thinking of Daniel Kahneman's paradigm of system one and system two thinking. So system one thinking is quick visceral associations. And this is actually where implicit bias lives. In contrast, system two thinking is slow. It's logical, deliberate thinking. Now, let me be clear. System one thinking isn't all bad. It's actually what allows us to be so fast and so quick and efficient, but it's a double-edged sword. So let's look at some examples. A three-year-old girl comes in with a barky cough, croup, easy, next patient. A young female with a third presentation of palpitations, anxiety, next patient. An indigenous man presents altered, drunk. So these are quick, reflexive gut feelings and associations that we make that we're actually often not even aware of. And this is the problem with implicit bias and system one thinking. 
we come to rely on it so much. And while it actually helps us with a large portion of our patients, it often has a negative effect on marginalized patients like Brian Sinclair and on other people of color. So what's the answer in emergency medicine? You know, we have these biases that help with some patients. They, they help us be fast and efficient, but they actually cause harm to other patients such as racialized populations. Well, it's not so easy as just ignoring all of our biases. You know, we can't just stop our biases from influencing us by sheer force of will. The very nature of implicit biases is that they're occurring unconsciously and so we can't just disregard them. But this idea of just leaving our biases at the door is actually pervasive in medicine. In fact, it's in our oath. So this is a portion of the modified Hippocratic Oath, and I swore that a few years back. And it states, I will not permit considerations of age, disease, disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between me and my duty to my patient. And we all swore something to this effect. Now, the implication of our Hippocratic Oath is that we shouldn't have any biases. And we need to treat every single one of our patients exactly the same way and ignore every single one of these factors. And that's because we in healthcare suffer from something known as the angel complex. We so badly want to be, want to be good. We want to help people. And so we feel that as healthcare providers, this means that we shouldn't have any biases. Before every single shift, I'm supposed to take all of my biases, you know, put them in this little box, drop it off by urgent care, and then go treat every single person exactly the same and equally. We're supposed to be these like perfect angelic doctors with no biases. But that's actually a myth that's perpetuated by our system that goes as far as our Hippocratic oath. And it brings up a key point, which is the myth of neutrality. This idea of being this perfectly neutral doctor is actually impossible because our implicit biases are gut reactions that we often can't control and aren't even aware of. And so we need to recognize this idea of neutrality as a myth. And instead, we need to reframe our expectations to one where we all have biases that we bring and use to uh, every single day at work to be fast and efficient. It's not just about being nice or kind or a good person. You know, I could be as altruistic as I want and I will still have biases. It's not about preventing me from having biases, but it's about recognizing when that bias is playing a role and influencing my care negatively on marginalized patients. If we don't start reflecting on our race-based implicit biases, then we're saying that it's okay that our biases are hurting our patients. You know, when we prescribe a medication and it leads to iatrogenic injury, we reflect on that and we think about how we can avoid it from happening again. Well, you can think of it the same way with implicit biases. Our implicit biases are hurting our patients and leading to iatrogenic injury. And so we need to reflect on our biases to mitigate the damage. So how do we actually recognize when we are being biased by someone's skin color? And how do we stop it from influencing patient care negatively? Now, you may have your own strategy. Um, and if so, uh, I, I encourage you all to share that. If not, you can use the pause framework. So this is an actionable item. The pause framework is a tool that you can actually use on your next eMERGE shift. The first step, is to pay attention to key moments that may display your bias. Now, I've personally found that the easiest way to do this is when I leave a patient's room and I'm really feeling some kind of strong emotion. For example, I'm really upset or frustrated. But think about key moments where you're feeling a lot of counter-transference. This likely signifies that you're relying on your implicit biases. Another time I use this um, framework is when I see a patient and in my mind, I say the word probably, they're probably drunk, they're probably drug seeking. That word probably is my personal cue to use this framework. The next step is to actually acknowledge the assumption you're making. And after you do that, you need to understand your own perspective. Why did you think that? What prompted you to make that assumption? The S here is to start seeking a different perspective. 
And this is where you critically start considering a different way of thinking and viewing that person. And a key part of that is actually empathizing with the patient and trying to see their perspective and their point of view. And the last step is to examine your options and make a decision. Now, the pause framework is like any other cognitive forcing strategy. Everyone has to find what works to them, for them, but this is one possible option that you can use on your next emerge shift. So thinking about your biases and assumptions is challenging. It's uncomfortable. And it's actually a very normal reaction to feel defensive and upset. And this ties back to, our myth, to that myth of neutrality and the angel complex. We so badly want to be those perfect angelic doctors with no biases that when we expose ourselves to our biases, we feel anger and frustration because we're fo forced to think about how we may not be this ideal doctor version of ourselves that we imagine. So I'm gonna share a story with you. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, uh, I was obviously thinking about my own biases a fair amount. And on an eMERGE shift uh, several months ago now, I, was, I saw a 57-year-old brown male who was found outside by the police wandering. He was agitated and altered, so I had to sedate him and restrain him to facilitate a workup. And we found out that he had this history of seizures and frequently presented like this and usually cleared on his own. I went back to reassess him and he was calm at this point, but just kept asking, please, can you remove my restraints? And for some reason, I, I just was hesitant at that point. So I went to talk to the nurse and they didn't feel comfortable at all removing the restraints. So I just said, okay. And this whole time, the patient just kept begging us to remove the restraints. And I had this pit in my stomach. I couldn't help but wonder, you know, was it my implicit biases about this being an agitated colored man preventing me from re removing those restraints? Would I have been more forceful to remove the restraints if he was white? The patient ultimately improved, and as he was about to go home, he actually took the time to thank me for taking good care of him. And that was a really hard night because I can never truly know if my implicit biases influenced that patient's care negatively. But I was upset, and I was frustrated, and I felt a lot of shame. And I really had to think about what kind of doctor I wanted to be. And what was really challenging about this was that I was literally studying racism and I was thinking about bias every single day and I still did this under the guise of safety. What's scary is that I actually noticed at that time. How many times did I do this and not notice it? And how many times have we all done this and not noticed it? And the point of that story is to share that we all have biases and it will still play a role. Our job isn't to remove the bias, but it's to recognize when it's playing a negative role with tools like the pause framework. And it's also to highlight that discovering your biases is, is painful work, but it's our responsibility to try to prevent it from becoming discrimination. We actually discuss our biases all the time. So just look at our M&M rounds. You know, we often talk about unconscious biases, but Oftentimes, we focus on things like confirmation bias or anchoring bias. Now, I'm sure it takes a special bravery to present at an M&M rounds in front of your peers, but I've never seen someone share an implicit bias about a patient's characteristics that influence their care. So I ask you to reflect. If you were presenting M&Ms tomorrow, would you feel comfortable demonstrating your own implicit bias about a patient? If that answer is yes, then actually sharing that bias in that format is a great way to help normalize the bias and remove that myth of being perfect, neutral, angelic doctors from our mind. And if the answer is no, then ask yourself what needs to change in our culture before we get to the point that you're actually comfortable sharing your bias. Here's the take home from this section. We are not perfect angelic doctors, and we all have implicit biases. And we need to reframe racial bias as something that is actually constant and use tools like the pause framework to help us recognize when it is influencing our care negatively. 
So we'll come back to bias later. For now, let's shift the conversation to another key point that's been discussed more and more, and that's the idea of systemic racism. And this is the idea that institutions like medicine are set up in a way so as to disadvantage a group of people. And we often do that. We often focus on this concept of systemic racism by looking at those who are disadvantaged. But it's critical to recognize that while the system is disadvantaging one group, it's actually providing unearned advantages to another group. So a good way to understand this is by looking at this coin metaphor. So let's take a close look at this picture of a coin as a metaphor for a system of inequality. So the coin itself is a system of inequality. The coin is racism in this case. Those at the bo bottom of the coin are those who we are, we are oppressing by imposing a series of disadvantages that are both unearned and undeserved. And the flip side is the top of the coin, which is privilege. And this is the group of people that have a set of unearned advantages. In our society, the coin is set up so that our white patients see privilege, while those who are not white are oppressed. Now, this talk is focusing on racism so that I could drill down into specific concepts. But it's really important to note that racism is just one piece of the puzzle. And we can actually view all of the other isms in this way. For example, sexism. As you look at some of these inequalities, there will be some in which you are oppressed and you will be very aware of the unearned oppression that you experience. Then there will be other inequalities that you have privilege in and you may actually be blind to that privilege. For example, as a brown person, I'm acutely aware of how racism impacts me because I'm part of the oppressed group. But as a male, I'm in the privileged group and I may actually be blind to that privilege. When I go into a resuscitation room and I start giving out orders, I may not be questioned because I'm male. People may just implicitly listen to me and I won't notice that privilege on a daily basis. In contrast, my female colleagues may experience challenges in that scenario that they would be acutely aware of because they experience it regularly as part of the oppressed group. And this is an important concept to understand because of the idea of dismantling systemic racism. We can't actually dismantle systemic racism by only focusing on those who are oppressed. It's equally important to recognize that while we are oppressing one group, we're giving privilege to another group. They're truly two sides of the same coin. Now, each of these systems of inequalities can be considered their own coin, but importantly, they actually intersect in very profound ways. Having multiple marginalized identifiers can have a detrimental effect that is much larger than just adding up any of these inequalities. So Brian Sinclair, for example, was a disabled person of color who was impoverished. And each of those systems of inequalities intersect with one another to provide a far greater stigma than anyone alone. And those intersections of inequality make us more prone to implicit bias negatively influencing those patients. While I focus on systemic racism for the rest of this talk, the intersectional nature of these inequalities should actually remain in the back of our minds because racism is, again, just one piece of the puzzle. And each of these inequalities could be their own talk. When we talk about systemic racism in Canada, we have to begin with a brief historical look at racism in Canada. There are three groups of people in Canada that have had a particular history of discrimination against them. And that's the indigenous, black Canadians, and immigrants, especially Chinese, Japanese, and South Asians. Now, there are many other groups that have experienced racism in Canada. So obviously this is not all inclusive and it's a very truncated version of our history. Indigenous people were the original settlers of this land and have had their land strip had to endure residential schools where they experienced physical, mental, sexual, and spiritual abuse. And then in the 1960s, experienced the 60s scoop where Indigenous kids were actually stolen and adopted to white families in, a, in an attempt to purge their culture. Black Canadians first migrated to Canada in the late 1700s as loyalists after the American Revolution. And they ended up settling in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in a town called Africville. 
And over the next 300 years, they were frequently torn from their homes and relocated to less desirable locations without any compensation. And immigrants, including Chinese, Japanese, and South Asians, have also been subject to racist practices. The 1880s had Chinese laborers subject to horrific working conditions for a quarter of the pay that white workers re received. Japanese Canadians experienced the internment camps during World War II, and almost all minorities were prevented from entering any professional schools, including medicine, until the mid-1900s. Now, you may feel like relying on that angel complex to say that, well, you know, this is the rest of society. It's not the medical field. Let me be clear, medicine has been a big vehicle for racism. In the 1920s, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments included doctors blatantly lying to black Americans and withholding treatment for syphilis just to see what happened to them. And in Canada, we have a history of doctors forcing sterilization on, on indigenous women as part of the eugenics program to purge the indigenous population. So medicine is not innocent. The brutalization and dominance of these people has reverberated through time and it still affects their descendants today. And it has led to many visible minority groups being suspicious and fearful of our medical system because of this history of abuse and mistreatment. And the racism has a huge impact on our patients' social determinants of health from food security to poverty to education to housing. All of these things are influenced and impacted by the history of racism that we have in Canada. Now, when I was a medical student and I first learned about social determinants of health, I remember I turned to my friend and I said, man, I don't need to worry about any of this. I'm going to become an eMERGE doc, okay? I'm going to be intubating people and running cardiac arrest all day. It's going to be awesome. I don't need to worry about any of this nonsense. And that was obviously extremely naive because I spend most of my time in urgent care treating abdo pain. And the lesson that I had to learn was that these patients show up in our doorsteps and their health outcomes are influenced by the history of racism that people have experienced. We see the effects of social determinants of health and systemic discrimination more than any other field of medicine because we're the safety net. The emergency department is the safety net that marginalized populations rely on when they can't access healthcare. And not only that, as we'll go into, the effects of systemic racism are hiding in nearly every aspect of what we do. The amount of health disparities due to racism is staggering. Um, I've listed some of them here, but it's way too many to talk about. So we're going to focus on three examples as they relate to the emergency department. Out of hospital cardiac arrest, analgesia, and COVID-19 with steps on what we can do. So cardiac arrest, okay, this is our wheelhouse. This is what we train for. We think about how out of hospital cardiac arrest survival is affected by initial rhythm and time to CPR. But do we ever think about how racism influences cardiac arrest survival? One of the best studies that we have is the Shaw 2014 paper from the States. And this was a systematic review and meta-analysis of 15 studies that looked at cardiac arrest metrics and compared that, them amongst races. And the bottom line was that patients who were black were less likely to obtain ROSC in compa comparison to patients that were white. The odds ratio was a staggering 0.59 for ROSC in black patients compared to white patients. And it gets worse. Black patients were less likely to get bystander CPR with an odds ratio of 0.66 or have a witness arrest with an odds ratio of 0.77. And these are staggering. And it isn't just limited to black patients. Hispanic patients and Asian patients were also less likely to obtain ROSC compared to white patients. What about a more recent study? So this is the NAME 2019 CARES analysis of pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And it examines 7,600 um, pediatric, pediatric cardiac arrest with a primary outcome of bystander CPR. Compared to white children, bystander CPR was less likely to occur in any minority child with an odds ratio of 0.59. So why is there such a discrepancy in bystander CPR and other cardiac arrest metrics? Well, part of it may be implicit bias, like we discussed earlier, 
people may have a bias against non-white people and thus be less inclined to perform CPR. But a larger factor is likely systemic. The neighborhoods people live in, the education they have access to, the resources allocated to that neighborhood. It's all multifactorial. The brunt of a history of racism has led to minorities either having less easy access to CPR training, live in areas that don't have AEDs, or have poorer health because racism leads to negative uh, social determinants of health. But this is in America, right? So what about Canada? Well, frankly, we actually don't know. Um, given how similar our cultures are, I think the and the history of racism that we have here, I think it's actually very highly likely that this occurs in our context. But we actually simply don't have the data for our population. So next time you see a minority with a cardiac arrest in your ED, this is what they carry with them. And it has a far greater effect on their outcome than we imagined. But clearly this is a, a symptom of a problem that is so large and, and wide scoping and all the rationale that I listed like poverty, food insecurity, housing, th these are not things that we can easily change as eMERGE docs. Of course, we can advocate, but we still rely on politicians and policymakers to influence things like poverty and housing. So how can we as eMERGE docs make any systems level change regarding racism? Well, I think we have to remember that we can still affect the system at our emergency department level. Many of you sit on committees which can draft, drastically influence our patient care because we help create the emergency department system. So this is an actionable item. It's important to leverage your position on committees to consider race inequalities and how improvements can be made. The first step is creating an EDI, an Equity, Diversity and Inclusivity Committee, and then liaising with that committee about your policies. And that's how you can make systemic change. So let me give you an example. Um, Drs. Lisa Thurger and Dr. Mike Ho are residency program directors um, uh, at TOH. And they're leveraging the position as program directors to create an EDI curriculum for residency training. That's a huge win. Another example is the SIM program at TOH. They've recently obtained diverse SIM models that are not just white males. And now it's up to the SIM educators to use those resources to create diverse and culturally appropriate SIM scenarios. Now, I know what you're thinking. Is the color of a SIM model really going to influence cardiac arrest survival? Pro probably not. But when we think about inclusivity, it actually really matters. You know, the idea that I could actually practice resuscitating someone who is my own skin color is both amazing and unheard of at the same time. So these little interventions add up. They actually matter. And they're an example of how we can use our positions on committees to make systemic change. So I ask you to reflect, how can you leverage your position on committees to make a positive impact? Let's shift our attention to something that you can focus on on your next shift. We're gonna talk about analgesia. We do this all the time, on every shift, multiple times. There is actually a discrepancy in analgesia prescription between white and non-white patients. And there are a lot of papers supporting this idea. One of the most recent was the Goyle 2020 paper. So this is a cross-sectional retrospective study of pediatric patients with long bone fractures that presented to seven EDs. They looked at 21,000 um, ED visits in EDs that were part of the PCAR network. Minority children were less likely to receive opioids or achieve optimal pain re reduction in comparison to white patients. These discrepancies are starting at the moment patients even enter the healthcare system. We're doing this to kids, and that's kind of heart-wrenching and uncomfortable to think about. And the current accepted rationale as to why this is happening is because our implicit bias is favoring white patients, and it's against those that are not white. Now, in our EDs, the perfect storm of patient that is both racialized and needs analgesia is the patient with sickle cell disease. And in Canada, those patients are predominantly black. Let's examine a scenario. So let's say you're on shift right now and you see a 45-year-old female who presents with sick, who has sickle cell disease. 
and you diagnose her as having a vasoocclusive crisis. So as you go back to um, putting in your analgesia orders, you may start using system one thinking and go on autopilot with, when, with writing that prescription. And that actually exposes your patient to implicit biases. So how can you avoid that? Well, one way is to use the pause framework that we discussed to force yourself to share the patient's perspective, and that may help mitigate the bias. Another way is to actually use a standardized sickle cell pain protocol. So this is another actionable item. Sickle cell societies have actually long recognized the role that implicit bias and structural racism has on our willingness to prescribe aggressive analgesia to this patient population. And so sickle cell um, societies actually have recommendations that we all adopt sickle cell disease specific pain protocols because they standardize care and reduce the impact of our implicit biases. Now, from a systems perspective, the first step obviously is to create and have a sickle cell pain protocol. But the next step is to ensure that you are using it. So at TOH, where I predominantly work, we have a sickle cell pain protocol, but the usage rate is not good. It's 53%. So one small way to reduce your racial bias is to use a sickle cell pain protocol on your next shift. And that concept can be translated to other painful conditions like renal colic, for example. Now, it's important to recognize a few caveats to this. One, this does not remove bias. There is still bias at play amongst how the entire healthcare team treats that patient. So we actually need to empower our patients to ask for pain meds if they need it and check in to see that pain protocols are, are being implemented aggressively. The second caveat is that this is just one small step. It doesn't solve the problem. However, these talks can sometimes leave us feeling so overwhelmed by the scope of the problem. And if you're feeling that way, then this is just one small step you can take as an individual provider on your next emergency shift. So let's shift gears to what we thought was the great equalizer, COVID-19. Now, when COVID-19 first occurred, we were all talking about how everyone is at risk and this virus is gonna affect everyone equally. And then news articles from the state started coming out saying that, you know, we're seeing a lot of minorities being affected and that's kind of strange. And then in some US states where black people accounted for 15% of the population, well, they were as high as 50% of the COVID positive cases. In November of 2020, we finally got some Ontario data uh, titled The Individual and Social Determinants of COVID-19 in Ontario, Canada. And this was a population-wide study. And they looked at 14 million Ontario patients that were tested. 3.3% of them tested positive for COVID. And the highest risk was found to be tied to racialized people that had poor social determinants of health. So people in areas of, of increased housing density or low educational attainment had increased risk of, of, of getting COVID. And if Ontario is too broad for you, let's focus on Ottawa public health data. And this was released a few months back. So focus in on the, on the top bar here. In Ottawa, racialized people, and this means anyone who was non-white, make up 29% of our population. They are 63% of our COVID-19 positive patients. This is happening in our community and to our patients. You're seeing this in the emergency department every single day. And the staggering thing of this was that we were actually testing immigrants less. In Ontario, areas where immigrants lived had a lower odds of being tested. And the researchers concluded that it was likely our implicit bias playing a role. In Ontario, if you lived in an area with other visible minorities, your odds ratio of having COVID-19 was 1.22, but your odds ratio of being tested for COVID-19 was 0.73. So on the one hand, we have a group of people that is more likely to have COVID, but we're actually less likely to test. And this is where systemic issues and implicit bias really work together to cause true oppression. Our system and the history of discrimination has set up a population of minorities that have lower social determinants of health, which predisposes them to COVID. 
And then our implicit biases as healthcare providers actually makes it more likely for us to not test them. Now, a common argument against implicit biases is that, well, my ability to be objective prevents me from treating people differently. So let's examine that thought process as it pertains to COVID-19. In general, if you see a patient who's COVID positive and they're saturating 94%, well, you're probably gonna send that patient home. If a patient is saturating 90%, you're probably gonna put them on oxygen and give them dexamethasone. But we make those decisions on complete faith in the pulse oximeter. And this is a device we use on every patient every single day. So how was this device made? And who was it tested on? We have to go back to 1972. So the pulse ox was first designed in 1972, but it only actually regularly started being used in, 1970, in 1987. And most of the research was done by Dr. Do Dr. John Severingus. And this physician is actually a giant in medicine. He did a lot of the work on blood gas interpretation. He helped optimize that famous O2 dissociation curve we always talk about. And most notably, he did a lot of the testing on pulse ox symmetry. And this is a quote from one of his papers. In our 18 years testing pulse oximetry accuracy, the majority of subjects have been light skinned. So now November, 2020 hits, COVID is raging across the world and hospitals are finding that minorities are being infected by COVID at a disproportionate rate. So then this retrospective study titled racial bias in pulse oximetry was produced. They looked at uh, patients in ICUs across 178 hospitals, and they compared 37,000 pulse ox readings to the standard ABG. And they compared this in light skin patients and dark skin patients. And the primary outcome was looking for occult hypoxemia. This is where the O2 saturation on the, on the pulse ox read greater than 92% and there was a good plaque. But the ABG showed that the patient was actually hypoxemic. So dark skin was associated with a three times higher risk of having occult hypoxemia. And a pattern started emerging where the pulse oximeter consistently showed a 2% higher pulse ox reading in dark skin patients. Meaning that if the pulse oximeter was 92%, the patient may actually have a saturation of 90%. Now there are a lot of times when this actually doesn't matter but it might matter if a dark skin patient is saturating 92% and we rely solely on that number. We could miss patients that were actually hypoxemic and needed oxygen and dexamethasone. Now, the point of this is not to come up with some hack where you're subtracting 2% from every pulse ox reading in a dark skin patient or getting ABGs on everyone. You know, that, that would be ridiculous. But the point is to stop looking at the pulse ox as an objective value and instead start looking at it as a test and a test that has variance to it. The point is to recognize that there is a variance affected by the patient's skin color that actually impacts the reading that you have. And the reason that variance exists is because we only bother to test and validate the pulse ox in light skin patients. And the reason I bring this up is that we need to start thinking about how even our most basic objective tools in medicine, whether they be devices, lab tests, or decision rules, they're all very likely filled with the biases of the society in which they're developed. This is how broad systemic racism in medicine could go. It is threatening one of our vital signs. And that is the sheer scope of the problem at hand. And that is really overwhelming and uncomfortable. And during this talk, there may have been periods where you felt uncomfortable, and that's actually good. It's only by being uncomfortable with our status quo that we can start making some change. And that change starts by recognizing how we all have implicit biases and that these implicit biases are negatively influencing the marginalized patients in our busy ED environment. And it then involves recognizing that systemic racism is a two-sided coin where one group has privilege and another group is oppressed. And this is the crux 
of anti-racism. It's understanding that both are implicit biases and systemic racism actually work together and compound on each other to create health disparities. And it's this dangerous cycle where systemic inequalities and implicit biases are actually working together to oppress our patients. So today we use examples of cardiac arrest, analgesia discrepancies and COVID to highlight how racism impacts our patient care in the ED. But it's truly just the tip of the iceberg. These are just examples and, and symptoms of a much larger problem. But, you know, there are things that we can do from an individual provider basis, as well as from a systemic basis. So I started this talk by asking you to reflect. And if there's one thing to take away, it's that we all need to engage in reflection. We need to start incorporate, incorporating reflection as part of our daily practice. We reflect regular, regularly after a shift about, you know, if we should have ordered that CT or done blood work on that patient. Well, we need to start building in time to reflect on our own biases and inequitable practices. So on your next shift, we can try to recognize and mitigate that implicit bias by using the pause framework to reflect on your biases. We can then dispel the myth of neutrality by being more open about our biases. We can use protocols like the sickle cell pain protocol to standardize our care and reduce bias. And then we can use our position on committees to leverage to make systemic change by liaising with an EPI committee. Now I highlighted examples, but those are just jumping off points. We need to be role models to each other to show that you know this actually matters to us in Ottawa. And we need to show our learners that we don't tolerate explicit bias and we're using our position on committees to work towards change. And ultimately, we need to start recognizing just how pervasive systemic racism in medicine is to the point where even objective tools that we use are filled with the biases of our society. So with that, I wanna thank you all for inviting me to come and speak with you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. If you prefer to get in touch with me offline, uh, this is my email. Feel free to, to send me an email.